Howdy y'all, my name is Micah Edmonds and welcome to the third episode of Pixar Quality, a series in which I'm reviewing and ranking every Pixar film from their first quarter century of movie making. By now I've covered three films I think aren't really all that great, three films I think are a bit of a mixed bag with some stuff holding them back, but today the scales finally, if you're asking me, start tipping in the other direction where the good stuff starts outweighing the bad. Today I'm talking about Cars 3, Incredibles 2, and Monsters, Inc. Three good and fun movies that are good and fun to watch. You will have a fun and good time. If you'd like to see the series introduction and the reviews for the six films I've covered already, feel free to waltz on over to my channel and catch up, or just browse around to the specific movies you want to see reviews for. Do what you want. I'm not your bloody dad, am I? But these three films today are largely, I think, very enjoyable movies that are well worth the sit down. But because settling for less doesn't seem to be something that a Pixar fan really knows how to do, while these three films would be pretty damn solid projects from anybody else, I think their quality is very easy to weigh against the larger catalogue from this studio, and that's where their flaws really come into light. These are all good movies on their own, and in the wider scheme of animated films, these are three very solid options, but contrasted with the big hitters, I think they pale. These are three entertaining and enjoyable movies for sure, but this is Pixar, so that's not really what we're looking for, is it? We want something more. I think this bracket represents the last few steps before you get to the shining, gleaming door that is a film which truly boasts Pixar qualities. And while the reflections can be seen on the silhouettes of these three at times, they're more so brimming with the light of just straight up quality filmmaking. But allow me to get into it so I can show you what I mean. Let's do Cars 3 first up. Why not? <laughs> Lightning McQueen has been on the racing circuit for a good couple of years now, leading the pack and having a successful motorsports career which he feels fulfilled by. However, during the final stretch of one race, he and his friendly rivals are upset by a decisive victory from Jackson Storm, a new high-tech rookie who, as Lightning did many years ago himself, signals a distinct change in the sport. Soon older racers are retiring or being replaced by new high-tech cars, leaving McQueen as an elder statesman of the sport and unable to keep up with the top speeds that these new rookies can race at. Pushing himself a little too far to compensate, he ends up in a crash in the middle of a race, quite a devastating one. Not wanting to be pushed aside the same way that Doc Hudson was at the end of his career, McQueen's sponsor Ross Dees is bought by a mudflap magnate named Sterling, who encourages McQueen to upgrade his training to stage a comeback. He meets his new trainer, Cruz Ramirez, but doesn't take all that well to the tech-based way of racing. Striking a deal with Sterling, McQueen starts training the old school way on dirt tracks, retracing the steps of his mentor Doc to see if he can't be as fast as these new cars, he might be able to drive smarter instead. Cruz accompanies him to keep an eye on him during his training, but begins learning all these new tricks herself as well. After all this training though, it still seems that the inevitable is on its way. And while racing for what could be his final time, McQueen swaps out with Cruz to give her a chance at the racing dream she'd never had before and passes the torch to the next generation of racers. Cars 3 is a quality film, and like with a few other Pixar flicks, one that I find I enjoy more each time I sit down to watch it. On this occasion, I'm not gonna lie, during the ending race and that fully sick finale with the flip, I had a big dumb smile on my face, honestly just feeling pretty happy that I was watching a good movie, knew that I was gonna make a video about it, and I get to share excitement about it with a couple of folks. It just felt really good to do that. But that sense of reassurance which Cars 2 had so soundly fumbled wasn't something I had to wait until the end of the movie to find, no. Cars 3 feels great to watch immediately. It's very quick to get to the point to start paying homage to what made the original film pop. And truly, within moments, it feels as though Cars 2 is a million miles away. Why they ever thought these beautiful long lens shots and racing moments was ever worth replacing with anything else makes even less sense as soon as the movie gets rolling, and it gets rolling right away. Cars 
3 quickly feels aware of what opportunities it has as a sequel, and what some time away from McQueen may have actually afforded it, and in its apparent bid to win the franchise back to decency, takes advantage of many of those things. It knows it doesn't have to introduce certain characters, it can start telling the story immediately. And within 15 minutes has actually already started going for some emotional moments which do really land. McQueen's crash happens 13 minutes into the movie counting titles, and I'm surprised how much of an emotional punch it contains in that light, but it's just evidence that I think that Cars 3 is a terrifically paced movie that doesn't waste any time in getting going. And after watching a few films before this which had needed to spend the time with new characters and do origin story stuff, to me this felt really refreshing and terrifically executed. And on that crash, man, that crash really is something, isn't it? For a moment, I forgot that it's a living, breathing character and truly just saw a wreck of a vehicle flying through the air. The weight and the sparks and the dirt is really quite brutal to watch. The utter silence from McQueen in this moment and the removal of his emotion is quite a bold choice which gives that moment a real sense of seriousness and the powerful visual restraint here just slowly moving forward allows that moment to really speak for itself. It's a very well edited and highly emotive scene built really on the first film, not really anything this one's already done. The consequences of the crash aren't altogether that serious, but the execution of it roundly re-solidifies the Cars franchise of films to me as capable of being more than goofy bright entertainment for three-year-olds. It reaffirms their ability to be genuinely entertaining movies. From there the film has won me over, and I'm able to enjoy the characters within this new, slightly more distinguished atmosphere. I don't know if Cars 3 has as much momentum through its set pieces in some scenes as some people might prefer. It's definitely a film which takes its time in each of its individual environments, but I honestly quite like that, and I think it keeps moving from place to place, again at a good pace, and rarely, if ever, returns to the same environments again and again. It manages to get the best of the emotional soul and the heart of Cars 1 by letting us enjoy each place that it goes to, but going to new places continuously, and not compromising on its open desire to have some wacky fun set pieces too. You've got the best of both worlds here, and McQueen's resistance to technological training centers is a filmmaking choice centralized within a character actually. Some folks might have preferred the spy stuff from 2, but it's McQueen who is asking to return to the dirt and the older actual racetracks, and the high-tech racers are also the folks that he's competing with. So it doesn't feel like the film is openly ignoring Cars 2, more so saying that that approach isn't going to work for this character or story. It's quite a clever way to move away from many of the trappings 2 had created and make some distance whilst not openly condemning that work. And on the note of the competition here, I think this film does a really great job of showing what good sportsmanship looks like in contrast to open disrespect, which is something it kind of did in Cars 1, but it re-solidifies here. McQueen's original arc was something along those lines, but while he wasn't an awesome dude to begin with, he was more of a hothead than a tool like Jackson Storm is. We knew that Chick Hicks was the real douche nozzle, but by now McQueen is a super respectful guy, and Jackson Storm takes it further, which draws a really clear line between the sport and the people people who compete. It'll be quite important for the story the entire time that Lightning loves racing, but it's not the only part of his life that matters to him, and he knows the difference in keeping an equilibrium between these two sides of him. To emphasize that and really hone in on McQueen's arc as inheriting the spot as a mentor from Doc Hudson, there's a few moments of Paul Newman's voice returning with some unused audio from Cars 1 or seeing footage of him racing in his prime. Now Newman had passed away not long after the original Cars and something like a legend suddenly passing away isn't only something that Cars has needed to find a way to deal with. Philip Seymour Hoffman and Carrie Fisher at least had both been in the middle of franchises. With Cars 3 being an animated feature and it only being Newman voice which needs to be used, Cars 3 is able to navigate this situation with a slightly different approach than a live action feature, and it employs Doc in a way which pays respect to the actor, without really feeling as though it's unable to employ the character, and it finds a way to keep his legacy alive with his old friends like Smokey as well. I think Doc is utilized really well in the story, and I very much appreciated Cars 3's navigation of that aspect. The arc for McQueen is a very interesting story. Facing the inevitability of age is a clever combination of physical ability and motorsport concepts of driving, and it feels like a much more potent and effective investigation of a similar thing that Mike Wazowski had faced in Monsters U. For Lightning to be facing the end of his career, to be losing something rather than not being able to attain it to begin with is just plainly more emotional. Working 
looking in Doc as the car who'd faced that challenge before him and found an even more fulfilling journey afterward is a use of the character which was worth being sensitive about, but doesn't feel like a cheap play for sympathy and is a genuinely fantastic navigation of a very sad and unfortunate situation. I quite enjoy the tone of this film for those reasons. Whilst it deliberately replays aspects of Cars 1 and it's not altogether a terrifically original story, it's something that feels distinctly different for Pixar. They can often cover family and more universal aspects, but in terms of careers and aging, I think Cars 3, Ratatouille, Soul and Lightyear have come at this idea from different angles each and they kind of skew closer to speaking about things that explicitly adults might relate more strongly to. Obviously, none of these movies are made just for me, but as an adult, I'm going to appreciate that. And moments like The Crash, moments like McQueen's breathless and silent moment of realization after Cruz beats him at the final moment, moments like McQueen calling up Mater and asking for help from a friend when he just wants someone to talk to, is the kind of bolder, more emotive choice which helps Cars 3 break from its formula in a soft but important way. There might not be any fantastically unpredictable twists in the plot of the movie, the element of Cruz basically inheriting McQueen's spot is quite obvious right away, but it's these emotional departures, the sense of reflection and the somewhat mature feeling to the story which keeps Cars 3 engaging for me even so. I think in particular the softness of this film's time pressure is something that helps with that. Nearly every single Pixar film has a time pressure in its story of some sort. It's along with their matchstick going out moments is one of the essential things that carries over most of their movies. In Toy Story it's Moving Day, Finding Nemo, Darla's Birthday, Coco, Sunrise, Brave, Sunrise, Soul, the Dorothea Williams gig, Cars 1, the Piston Cup race in one week, you get the picture. Often the movies will have that time pressure, something that keeps the momentum up which the characters are always looking forward to, or the end of the movie is about, or they need to get to this thing before all is lost or something. But for Cars 3, while there is the first race of the season that McQueen needs to get to, it's not an event that is continuously beaten over your head, or one which really feels like it's all that impending and getting closer all the time. This allows Cars 3 to feel different for Pixar in a very important way, allows it to be more reflective and easier going, and it's a refreshing change to see. Another one of these is honestly the restraint on humour in this movie also. There's a lighthearted nature throughout the movie of course, and definitely a chuckle and enjoyment to be had, but I was a full half hour into the movie before I laughed at a joke. I think the Thunder Derby is obviously m where most of the visual comedy is centralized, and I think that section of the film is probably the weakest part, but it doesn't feel like 3 is suffering from slapstick tonal inconsistencies or employing humour in a way which actually deflates its more earnest moments. It also doesn't end up shooting too high on the emotional scale or constructing a designated cry time just because it needs to, and instead works up to its climactic moment as a thrill instead of being a weeping time. It knows that it's an exciting movie first of all, it's not trying to make the car movie get you really in your feelings. In regards to Cruz Ramirez, I think that Cristela Alonso is some seriously great casting here. She's got a terrific range as his character, able to sell the moments of competitiveness, the patronizing training scenes are very funny, the more emotional scenes come across without going overboard, and she actually has a really great scream. She pushes Lightning's character into a more interesting place while also feeling very three-dimensional herself and I end up really liking the character because the voice makes her so identifiable so quickly. This is the second time, however, that Nathan Fillion has shown up in a Pixar movie in a role that the man ain't suited for. He played a jock in Monsters University and here he plays Sterling, a rather one-dimensional bad rich guy who ends up kind of becoming the villain of the piece, well a secondary villain of the piece alongside Jackson Storm. Fillion has got a lot of voice acting experience, he's been in some very high profile video games and television series as well, but the dude's voice is smooth as silk, the man is suave as all hell, and I don't know why Pixar tried to put him in an antagonist spot twice. It's not the best use of him and as a result Sterling feels like a very by the numbers, unremarkable, obvious character because I'm not sure Fillion can really bring his strengths to it. It deflates a fair bit of the tension about the story and finale at the last moments here. Not sure that that's entirely up to the casting, maybe more so just the element of villainy, Sterling himself and what Jackson Storm kind of turns into by not really being used all that much, not really being a spot where Cars 3 breaks from any sort of formula at 
at all, and the place where its choices definitely feel the most obvious. In terms of visuals for this film, there's a couple of moments where if there aren't any cars on the screen, the whole thing honestly looks frighteningly photoreal. The dust and the water effects are off the chain here. The bit where McQueen gets blasted with water and it washes the mud off of him is absurd. How do you do this? The camera swing around him with all the wet mud and the glistening paint here is ridiculous. There's a section where Mac is driving across the country and there are matched cuts across different regions, but Mac very clearly doesn't match position frame to frame, even though he could. I really love animation filmmaking and I'm very much enjoying the recent uh, trajectory of characters in big budget movies being more overtly animated and less real looking, but that kind of realistic detail with the shooting, as if the film was shot live action, is a direction I have consistently enjoyed in Pixar's work and would love to see them maintain. But by this time, basically, it feels like Pixar have the visual prowess to basically do anything they want, and so their choices feel way more deliberate, particularly with character design. It might be within their powers to make a film which looks like actual people in the real Real world by this point, and it's the cartoonish tilt of the characters popping on top of their realistic worlds which has become a visual niche that they've wor really worked out in the past few years. I think Cars 3 shows off that spot very well. I don't really remember any early Pixar movie being nearly this bright. You can almost feel the difference between the emotion of the open broad midday sun and indoor fluorescent lighting environments. There's just more life outdoors. There are multiple directors of photography on this project at least which really helps all of this come across, but maybe I just own the 4K box set and watched it on an HDR television and that is just so, so much fun and I love it. The music of this movie is slightly underwhelming, however. It's a Randy Newman score, so you're going to get touches and moments which feel like they're straight out of the toy franchise every now and again. But Carr's ability to more openly use commercial songs and rock music does save it at important times. There's a couple moments of some beautiful Telecaster twang or generally awesome guitar tone that I definitely just have a soft spot for. Overall, Cars 3 is a fairly conventional work which, just like Onward, sells most of its moments really well but in my opinion makes a few more interesting calls. It sprinkles its risks in the right areas where it needs to and keeps its emotional trajectory in check. The arc for McQueen feels like a really solid storytelling basis which employs its characters mostly very effectively and its visual aspects are very exciting. Cars 3 doesn't achieve anything massively mind-blowing but it's a very enjoyable and excellently paced slice of entertainment which hits all the beats that it needs to to re-establish the Cars franchise as worth paying at least some amount of attention to. Refocusing on the racing aspects, retuning its environmental focus to keep the heart of the series alive, and orchestrating some emotional moments which go for something a little softer but also a little bit more bold, puts Cars 3 into the how to do a formula well territory, really for me. And again, I finished watching this movie with a really big dumb smile on my face, feeling pretty damn good about how I'm choosing to spend my time at the moment. If it means I get to watch, enjoy, and share enjoyment of films like this, then yeah. I, I could do a lot worse. Incredibles 2 was certainly a very hotly anticipated sequel, maybe not on the level of a Force Awakens or an Endgame, but of properties which have seen their origin while I've been on planet Earth. It had been enough time from the original film that Incredibles 2 might be the Godfather 2 of movies. What? Having said that, I'm going to do my best to take this movie on its own merits a little bit and try not to compare it to the first one more than I need to, since they were kind of developed in entirely different technological eras and in some ways very different worlds, and 2 does deserve its own assessment. It picks up immediately where the first movie left off, showing the family Pa fighting the Underminer before being detained by police, since causing property damage is still an illegal hobby to have. However, they're later approached by Winston Dever, a billionaire benefactor with ties to 
superhero work who wants to rehabilitate the superhero image and make supers legal again. Seeing that Helen Parr, Elastigirl, is the most fit for the job of presenting supers in a new light, Helen starts doing hero work, encountering a villain called Screenslaver, who uses hypnotic electronics to force people to do their bidding. She starts making headway, and a bunch of countries eventually agree that supers should be legal again. Meanwhile, Bob is left at home to learn that being a stay-at-home dad presents its own challenges, in particular trying to learn how to navigate Jack-Jack's uncontrolled superpowers and make amends with Violet after removing the memory of her from this boy that she has a big crush on. Eventually, Helen catches someone who is believed to be the screen slaver, but it turns out that it was Winston's sister Evelyn the whole time. She then puts a plan into motion to hijack the supers, to foil the rescinding of the anti-super law, and destroy the newly rebuilt reputation of superheroes to make them illegal forever and they're never coming back type thing. Helen and her family end up saving the day, stop a big boat from doing a big crash, and the family, now legal superheroes, begin a new chapter in their lives. I'm not exactly sure what order I should tackle Incredibles 2 in, because for once, I pretty much agree with the general consensus on something. Most folks know that this movie is entertaining, recaptures some of the spirit and appeal of the original, and gave us a bunch that we wanted, but does pale in comparison to the original in a lot of places, specifically with its villain. I don't think I've spoken to anybody who thought this movie was really awesome, let alone held a candle to the Originidig, and while I'm sure they're out there, I honestly don't even think most people remember Incredibles 2 all that well. It's not a memorable film, who could blame them? But it is a Brad Bird directed piece of animation, so that guarantees you're not getting a bad movie here. He just doesn't do that. You're getting a movie which isn't anywhere near the ceiling of what it could have been, but when Bird is directing, you've got at least something of a standard which the man simply does not and has not allowed his projects to drop beneath. For all its many problems, Incredibles 2 is a film which loves animation. It loves what it is as an animated project, and that's going to win it a lot of points with me because it was overseen by one of the best to ever do it. As a sequel, Incredibles 2 did feel very aware of the stakes though. And if we're going to keep being honest about it, Incredibles 2 is a really tough nut for me to crack. If someone wanted to make a case that the original Pixar is different from today's Pixar, this is where they go to find their answers. This is the film which is most representative of the change. And it's hard to talk about because it is good, but it's also not. And is blatantly a project which was walking into the waiting arms of an extremely high bar to clear. A bar that very few other Pixar projects are in the vicinity of. That's kind of a spoiler for my ranking, but man, making a sequel to The Incredibles is a tough thing to do, and the longer they left it, the harder it was always going to be. And they left it like 14 years and then lost a year of production on the back end. They had their work cut out for them. 2 continues and revitalizes the original 60s retro future or pop art stylings in its effort to recapture the magic, and particularly with wardrobe, hair, and effects, has really taken the opportunity to improve on the cohesiveness of the world. Cloth simulation is really interesting in this movie. Moving to a new city allows some very cool and distinctive Gotham vibes to come up. Some very cool lighting states and new locales take center stage, straddling a very cool out of time sci-fi vibe which feels unique. As if the tech is modern but the world is old, it's very cool. Ice, liquid, lightning and powers all look so layered and believable and cool. And believable is the word for this. Again, it's a Brad Bird movie, one of the current greats in the animation space, who was trained underneath founding figures of original Disney 2D productions. He's definitely up there with directors I personally very much admire. And this is the kind of movie that I really enjoy learning more about. And I was eager to dive back into extra material to learn about how it was made and help me see different tricks that help it really come to life. And something that kept coming up were the imperfections baked into the film's world to make it believable. Because believability, according According to Brad Bird makes you invest more in the characters if they feel like they're in a real space. Whether it's the bumps in the terrain of a vehicle in which the people are sat, or Violet's hair being blown back up by the hairdryer, I really love how every frame in this movie has that energy to it. It's a feast for the eyes. Every single thing here has been poured over and thought of, and it's a very enjoyable movie to watch, to observe and play again and again and again, to see all those little details and how they each support a scene or tell you about a character. That love is really what makes this movie fun for me. Definitely not so much the story, but the viewing experience of this film is simply without fault. Things like Dash being a consistently very high energy character, he loves using his powers to do everything while in private spaces. But when he opens the door to the slave supers, he immediately gets very sheepish and hides behind it as if it's his parents' leg. Hello there, little fella. 
Just a small choice which does so much to remind me that he's just a kid. There's never a symmetrical mouth in this movie. Everybody's face expresses their words differently in their own unique and personal way. Bob and Helen talking from two separate rooms while she brushes her teeth is exactly the incredible spice that works so, so well. Things like the scene of Violet at the high school is a great example of how great crowd work is in this movie. How the people milling around introduces you to the school location and directs your eye to the action. It feels interesting, but not too interesting to draw too much of your attention away from the main performances. As Violet feels alone and more isolated in the scene, the people in the background move away and disappear until it's just her and Tony in the hallway. So the scene feels busy and realistic as it establishes the location, but the whole world focuses in on and enhances Violet's change of emotion as it goes on. The same tool of crowd work accomplishes a lot of different tasks in one short moment. I do also very much enjoy Violet being a bit more featured in this movie relative to the first one. Dash had some really stellar moments in the first film and is less emphasized here, where Violet steps up to have a cool evolution with Bob, and I like her being a bit more strong-willed here. Normally she doesn't ever drip like this. As for Dash, Huck Milner plays him this time around, replacing Spencer Fox. And I've always been absolutely floored at how close to identical these two people sound. You can tell the difference at moments, but only just. And to find two kids that far apart who sound so similar, who can both perform the same character that well is absurd. But it's something that Pixar have actually done twice, here and with Nemo. Originally, Nemo was played by Alexander Gould, and then in Finding Dory, was played by Hayden Rowland and it must be a very strange and intricate and very scary world to find kids who sound the same and can perform the same roles that far apart. I, I think the less I know the better. <laughs> Bob's physical animation and Craig T. Nelson's performance remains so compelling and again he's really the heart of the story going on here. During tense moments his body or facial language does a lot to sell his own frustration at his own lack of control of the family situation. His annoyance at his own struggles and inadequacies rather than him lashing out at anybody else. It's a nicely balanced and careful arc for him and I do really enjoy watching a dad figure who's kind of allowed to express himself like this and show emotional weaknesses without being judged or punched down for it, and for how his raw emotion comes across so well without him really suppressing it. He quite possibly could have come across as too aggressive or too willful or closed off, and within the position he has within the family, you kind of don't want him to do that, but he rarely crosses that line and the humour really polishes up his weaker moments until we understand how the situation is funny and how he's attempting to really grow through it, like fight his own emotional instincts. It's very endearing. Again, he's the heart of the movie here and it works very very well. I really like Helen Parr as a character in contrast with that. How the flexible one who felt like she needs to hold it all together is shown that her protective nature can give way to trust and pride. That she can rely on her kids and her husband to be okay when she's not around is something I think could have been emphasized more strongly to show her be more overbearing to begin with but overall I just really do like Elastigirl and think she's a great and very cool character. I love following a character who who is capable and courageous and self-assured and intelligent. Often Pixar works follow a protagonist who has a rather obvious flaw or arc, but Helen feels very solidly like a character who's had a lot of time to become the person that she is, is navigating situations with confidence. It's engaging. It feels like the film respects my intelligence with that in a way they occasionally don't. Look to Lightyear for the most obvious example of the opposite. One capable character with a forced and obvious emotional flaw who's just dragging three useless idiots behind him is not nearly as fun or interesting as a capable person leading a crew of other capable people. Watching a solo hero just be good at what they do is honestly more fresh to me than it should be. Therefore, action sequences in particular in this movie are very, very good. A case can be made that this is the best action Pixar have produced. Most of these scenes are very ambitious and complicated given environmental continuity, multiple power sets or vehicles and movement being heavily involved. You're in a helicopter going topsy-turvy. You're in a boat where the background is constantly moving. You're running through small crowds evacuating a building. There's a constant sense of world speed while the fights are happening over multiple locations, which gives those sequences so much life. They're constantly evolving and changing. Nothing is repeated or feels overdone. Everything is clear, but exciting and tense. The beauty in how one awesome shot that you could feasibly watch the entire scene from lasts just barely a moment to cut to another equally awesome shot. Again, there's just so much to enjoy about every frame here. While I very much enjoy what an anime fight scene feels like it should be, of 
two equally graceful, adept characters looking totally sick while having an epic duel. What fuels the action here is actually the dirt and the struggle. How every hit and every escape feels like it only just works. It was just one second or one shifted foot away from going the other direction. The animators do such a terrific job of creating those picturesque plates and interesting locations, but smudging the action within it so that the fights don't feel choreographed. They're not perfect dancers. Things are in your way. They feel really believable, again, because of that dirt. The Elasticycle Chase in particular is among my favorite action sequences Pixar have yet produced. The sunset timing allows for some extremely cool two-tone lighting states, bathing the environment in this red glow that Elastic the girl's silver really pops on, before graduating up to a purple hue. The way the bike wobbles and travels imperfectly, the uniqueness of the way she and the vehicle integrate and move through the world, it's just such a delicious combination. It's high speed and slick, but you get that weight and the feeling of her heaving the bike's two halves along and upward, how she stretches out and then clicks the bike back together to pop herself up off the ground, the way she uses her body weight to improve its mobility, but how it also allows her to do things she otherwise couldn't is probably the best use of a stretching hero we've yet seen in a superhero movie. It's an ingenious way to utilize her power set, take it to a different place, take advantage of her flexibility, agility, and quick wits within an action sequence. There's a very distinctive way to how she stretches that feels bouncy and actual. She only stretches what and when she needs to, and along with the touches which show her struggling to catch up with the train and stay on balance really sells how capable she is, but how hard she's having to work at the same time. It's a terrific sequence which makes a very common set piece chasing and stopping a train that even Incredibles has done before feel engaging and fresh. But as a petty grievance of mine both Helen and Bob have super vehicles in this film that are really cool but they both clearly are called the wrong thing. They neither of them have the right name. It's the Elasticycle when it should be the Elastibike and it's the Incredibile when it's obviously should be the Incredicar. The Incredicar. It just rolls so much better off the tongue. You can make so many easy jokes about banks. Oh, look at this, the Incredicar. I gotta put it in ATM. Within these superhero fight scenes where heroes are fighting heroes, I do feel Dash and Bob are a little shortchanged and don't get as much of a moment to shine as everybody else does. But most people's powers are used very well in fights, creating small but interesting moments of conflict or a combination of certain power sets rather than just standing fights. I think Violet's force fields are mined for some really great moments and used very well consistently and the moment of Helen falling through the voids to get up into the uh, the plane is freaking sick. In terms of enjoying superpowers on screen as well, a lot of time in this movie, like a lot of time, is spent with Jack-Jack here, seeing all his many powers and how he uses them to fight a raccoon, how Bob tries to handle him, how Edna helps out. There's a lot of hijinks with Jack-Jack, which I really enjoy seeing, but it doesn't feel entirely relevant to a plot or a story here, especially not at the film's conclusion. He draws a lot of attention. It has a lot to do with Bob's arc of being a better dad, but toward the end of the movie feels like it's dragging for not a lot of payoff, and I think this is an indication of what's really off about Incredibles 2, because it's a lovingly made and entertaining visual feast that doesn't really have a point in the way it needs to. It just likes Jack-Jack. It just likes the characters. That's enough to make it interesting, but not really great. And it's not just the underwhelming villain that misses the mark here alongside, and it's probably a result of the release date for this movie being shifted up a year that meant a lot of things had to be dropped and left loose, but it means that Incredibles 2 overall to me just doesn't feel like it wants to be a movie, it's a season of television. It's lucky then that I love these characters and I'm fine with just watching them interact and do not much that's really important because if I didn't like the characters or the cast wasn't that great or the movie wasn't this well made, this story is really boring and nothing I actually care about actually really happens. It's a movie which enjoys just spending downtime with the characters. It doesn't have all that much of a driving force for plot and would clearly rather just show the people talking about issues from their different points of view for extended periods of time, which then suddenly remembers it needs to have an action movie climax at the last minute. If Incredibles 2 had been a season of television, I've no doubt this exact same story could have been served much more effectively than it was over multiple episodes, dedicating more time to giving each of the characters here their own low stakes meandering fun plot like it clearly wants to do. You wouldn't necessarily need to change much that's here, just extend it out and liven it with more depth. It's easy enough to imagine that being a solid Saturday morning thing on a Disney channel, or you know, on Disney Plus today, 
day. Which power is Bob going to have to handle this week? Which bad guy is Helen going to go after in her ongoing mission to prove that superheroes really should be legal? Juggle those plots and characters and give the kids focus episodes. It feels like that's what it already is at a lot of moments. But as it is, the story for Incredibles 2 doesn't develop the characters significantly enough from the first film. Most of them just end up in the same place where the movie started. It doesn't take place over a significant enough period of time to act in the way that a sequel like this kind of should. That being a story which pushes the characters to evolve and change and end up somewhere else by having them face a genuine challenge. By basing the film so soon after the first one, Incredibles 2 plays it extremely safe in this regard. It doesn't actually have to change or take risks with who the characters grew up to be in an interim that might upset audiences who felt attached to them as kids, but it misses the opportunity to do the Toy Story 3 of growing up with the audience. And while sometimes it's aware that it's starting basically right after the first film, at other times it feels ignorant of it, in a jarring way forgets to allow the characters to decompress from something pretty big that to us was 14 years ago but was to them 3 months. While speaking about bringing superheroes out of the darkness, it doesn't at all mention the lasting effects of Syndrome and the dozens of other supers that he killed in his scheme, including Gazer Beam and Vironic themselves who were name checked multiple times, seen in flashbacks and are important to Winston and Evelyn's backstory. If this is a story about superheroes returning, the gaping hole that a crazed superfan left in the old guard when he grew up should probably be something somebody mentions. Another random mysterious billionaire rich man offering assignments in hero work should be something that Bob is wary of. He only just got done being manipulated in this exact same situation. He falls for the same scheme again because he hasn't had time to develop out of those character flaws. Where Incredibles 1 used that opportunity to investigate the nature of partner deception, addiction, manipulation, Incredibles 2 walks into rooms like mob mentality. How wealth can help define public outlook or reside above and influence the law, and a public's preference of ease and convenience over quality, very little of the moment to moment plot feels like it's commenting on those themes or really relevant to them in any way. It has some really interesting verbal sparring scenes where characters with different points of views do respectfully discourse about things and that's really interesting, but where it counts, such as the ending, Incredibles 2 drops the idea of thematic extrapolation faster than you can say boo, and leaves a lot of its ideas, a little like Brave, very unresolved. I think the connection between Evelyn and Helen is quite well teased and developed to begin with, but obviously her reveal isn't really that great. It was interesting watching the commentary for this movie, featuring a few animation supervisors speak about how Evelyn begins the film dressed in very drab clothing, earthy tones to help her blend into the background while she just lounges around. But as the screenslaver starts appearing, her wardrobe gets more and more complex, so as to tease and signify the coming twist without being too obvious. How her animation and progression in each scene rewards repeat viewings to show how she was hiding in plain sight. It sounded like a lot of thought and time went into the visual side of making that reveal satisfying and sudden. Except the name is literally Evil Endeavor so I'm not sure that subtlety was worth it. But Incredibles 2 is for sure an underwhelming film when it comes to story, and as a point of difference from films like Cars 3, is probably one that I like less each time I watch it. It'll very likely slip down in a year or two, just right now this is where it's at, carried by its animation and visual command. As a piece of spectacle, I really do think there's a lot to enjoy. It's a cut above. It's an entertaining, vibrant, very engaging, watchable piece of animation filmmaking that does a pretty good job not not drawing attention to its own shortcomings. There's so much to learn from the way it's made, so much life in how this film feels to watch. I don't find it formulaic, but I do find it underwhelming. And in regard to Pixar's catalog, this is as far as you get when you play it safe. Because the longer that I sit down to think about the movie's story and its themes, the worse a job I think it does. Because right now, you run into a lot of problems here. It feels really ironic that the billionaire screen slaver lady talks about how constant media consumption waters people down, but it's a Disney movie, which itself points out the irony of billionaires not really being held to the same standard as regular people in a line, which is itself failing to present nearly enough depth to its story to merit its own existence. That's a really harsh and lofty way to put it, let me try and simplify that. 
Oh wait. I'm not trying to do an analysis of the movie. I'm doing a review retrospective, so I'm I'm not going to go in too deep on all the plot contrivances and holes. I'm sure somebody else has already done that. But when I do really think about it, it gets worse the longer I the longer I look. But to pinpoint my issues with the feeble story here, I think what I'm gravitating toward talking about makes it pretty clear already. I'm getting stuck on the issues to do with superheroes, to do with the world building, when Incredibles 1 really didn't have that problem. The veneer of superheroes was really just that, it was a doorway to make a story about addiction and deception and trust more appealing, but it did a really quick job of washing its hands of many of the other nitty gritty details about superhero work, and that allowed it to place that idea into the corner where it stayed and wasn't outshining anything else. That's how to tell, for me, a great Pixar movie from the others, when the concept of the film is just a doorway into the larger story and it doesn't get stuck on where it's set or its premise at all. The first story that you're shown, a superhero movie, a rat cooking movie, a movie about toys, ends up being switched for something else that you didn't see coming. Addiction, artistry and identity, belonging. When I watch Incredibles 2, I don't think the film does that switch very effectively. It doesn't do nearly as smooth a job of lifting me out of the rut and the trappings of superhero powers and hero work and costumes and laws to get into wider character arcs and themes all that well at all. I just get stuck on things. This is the Pixar threshold, when the method of storytelling acts as a gateway into that deeper narrative. Incredibles 2 is a few paces back and it's, for me, kind of difficult to go that last few steps to get past the door. I really don't think that I, as a viewer, am given much of a concrete reason to believe that superheroes should be made legal again within this world. And given that that emotional hook has failed, I don't think the rest of the movie falls into place either. Other than that, the Parr family and Frozone are characters that I like, they still don't seem to be all that necessary for this world to function. And the points that screen slaver or public officers make aren't adequately counted here. Presumably, the world has been operating fine for the past 15 years without superheroes, it sure seems to be, and the only real reason to allow them out in public again is for their own sake. Both villains from both movies were motivated by supers themselves to either resurrect or destroy their spectre. So if there's no supers, there's also no villains and therefore no need. But also, both of the bad guys were billionaire magnates, so maybe if you eat the rich and stop capitalism, there's no bad guys either and there's still also no need for superheroes. Uh, politics is fun, isn't it? I'm just not convinced the film uses enough imagination to move superpowers and people who have them into areas aside from using them to be heroes. If people are born with powers that's going to shape industry, not just vigilantism. There's a very clear bubble this movie is operating in that it needed to go beyond to flesh out the world if it was going to make a second movie, I think. Just the fiction of the world doesn't feel like it's really worth interrogating. It feels very, very thin. Incredibles 2 isn't a fantastic fantastic movie when it comes to that stuff. But again, it's an entertaining flick with some fantastic action sequences, terrific characters, and gave me more of the surface level of what I liked about the original. Its sophistication of execution definitely makes up for the boilerplate thematic landing in some areas. It's very worth watching, just do yourself a favour and don't think about it too hard. Let the characters charm you, let the action thrill you, and leave it at that. It's not a great story, it absolutely feels like it's being held back by something. It's not just the underwhelming villain, it's an entire shrunken stomach when it comes to meteor story elements, which treats itself a little like a brisk tour of a beautiful rental property, walking through every room in the house without really giving you a chance to look at what you're getting before it moves on. I imagine it has a lot to do with the ironically rushed production for a highly anticipated release, but still, it cracked a billion dollars, so it must have done something right. At the end of the day, this is a superhero sequel, and that's not something that we're skint on. I don't think Incredibles 2 really needed to happen. I don't think it had a lot of opportunities given its chosen time frame, and therefore I'm not disappointed by it. It's superheroes. It's treaded territory. What, what did we expect? Pixar have surprised on this front before. It's not wrong to want it to be awesome and mind-blowing, but it's wrong to expect it. Two is entertaining, and that's all it actually needed to do. With Toy Story, you can go there as many times as you want, and I will always watch a new Toy Story, but with Incredibles, I think you return to the well and you sully the water. It's better to just leave it wondering how much there was left rather than turning around and seeing disappointment in the shallowness. I'm not harsh on Incredibles 2 because it wasn't something I honestly cared about whether it worked or not, but it does kind of undo that feeling of conclusivity which the first did provide, and now I do want for a third Incredibles movie to wrap things up better than this one did. Hopefully one which actually says something interesting.
Gee, that was a long section. Monsters Inc's pretty good in it. Sally and Mike are a couple of regular Joes working at the local Monsters Inc power plant, Scream Factory, where monsters sneak into children's bedrooms to scare them and use the power of their screams to fuel their city and homes. Definitely the hardest Pixar premise. About to hit the all time scare record, Sully and Mike have things pretty good as a couple of relatively unattached fellas, even in spite of an energy shortage as a result of kids growing some spine in the recent past because all their parents are letting them watch the Saw movies. That's pretty rad. One night, Sully discovers that Randall, a co worker, is working late and lets a child out inadvertently into the monster world. Now children are said to be toxic to monsters so naturally Sully freaks out about the girl escaping and doesn't really know what to do because there's authorities chasing them. Eventually deciding with Mike to simply put her back into her door while they still need to avoid the child detection agency, they stumble upon Randall's plan to address the scare shortage using machinery instead of scarers which he was going to test on Boo. The company CEO Mr. Water News turns out to be in on the scheme but Sully and Mike eventually deal with Randall expose water news and get Boo back to her home. They even discover that making kids laugh instead of making them scream results in a more powerful energy source and everything turns out okay and Mike is actually able to reconstruct the door to Boo's bedroom allowing her and Sully to reunite. Monsters Inc was the fourth ever Pixar film following Toy Story 2 and was the first one by the studio to not be helmed by John Lasseter. Pete Docter stepped up to the plate to direct alongside co-directors Lee Uncritch and David Silverman. While Pixar also moved their entire staff and so they're now legendary campus in Emeryville, California while working on this project, so this film was, surely, a bit of an uncertain time for Pixar. While they were enjoying their success so far, it had yet to be seen if the Pixar magic could really be spearheaded by someone else, and the launch of only their third IP must have been a very nervous time. Monsters Inc. was obviously an enormous success. The film did very well commercially and has enjoyed a long and well-earned iconic legacy. The film is funny, it's charming, it's eminently quotable, it's relatable to all sorts of people for all sorts of reasons, it's got a very resonant emotional core and it's an undeniably stellar jewel in the Pixar belt. While I believe that I personally did see Toy Story 2 in the cinemas when I was young, Monsters Inc is the first one I actively remember going to watch and being excited to sit down in a theatre and see. Little five-year-old me went to the Hoyts at the Tea Tree Plaza in big old Adelaide while on holiday visiting my grandma and my cousins holding my little Boo Macca's Happy Meal toy. It's a feat but maybe that's the most niche and Australian sentence I've ever said on this channel and at this point, that's a pretty high bar to clear. So maybe I'm softly entering here because while I certainly know that the films I've talked about so far have their fans and audiences, this is the first one where I think I might get in trouble. Monsters Inc. is somebody's favorite and they will come for me in the night with spikes. But while I respect Monsters Inc. and I understand that it's a very effective film in many ways and certainly pushed a lot of tech boundaries at the time, I don't think it really holds up in a lot of areas today and I come away from specifically the viewing experience of it somewhat indifferent. I definitely enjoy enjoy a lot about this, but there's something about the execution here that's simply not what I want it to do. It's not a fair set of criteria to judge it against, but this is a personal thing, so I'm not going to hide that my bias isn't whatever. Maybe I'm just jaded, but Monsters Inc. doesn't win me over in the way that it used to. I'm not going to look for reasons to dislike it or really work hard to disprove its obvious qualities, but this is definitely a case of me understanding the film's merits as opposed to really enjoying and feeling engaged in it. It's like a Jordan Peele movie. I know it's really good and I very much enjoy thinking about it and talking about it, I just don't really like watching it. I mentioned a couple of my issues with the Monsters IP when I spoke about Monsters U, so I may as well start from there. This one is not nearly as messy from a world building standpoint. The film is obviously much more focused on its story than its aesthetics, but this property is still probably the one of Pixar's catalog which appeals to me personally the least. While I really like the premise, this approach doesn't do it justice for me. I'm not a fan of the visual approach, the character designs, or the world choices really at all, and I don't think it's aged particularly gracefully visually specifically. And while Monsters U is one thing, revisiting ink does expose to me a lot of those garish colour choices, plain environments, and at times wonky visual gags which leave me entirely unmoved. Just the aesthetic, just the look of this film, I don't vibe with. Is, is not a style that I like. In addition, it seems the time that this film released has given it a pass or a level of acceptability for a kind of nitpicky read that it probably wouldn't get away with if it was new today. The children's bedrooms are very insular and I don't know where the adults are in those houses or if the monsters are purely imaginary, which if so, what are we even doing here? When I was a kid, I more so thought of monsters hiding underneath a bed, not being in a closet. So only using doors for entrance points seems limiting and 
not really in keeping with the idea in uh, a general sense. The approach to the premise basically depends on you accepting its very, very visible boundaries. I find the music of the film also fairly underwhelming. To open the movie, you've got that very iconic two minute jazz fest about doors, which while toe-tap and fun, if we're honest, doesn't really have much to do with anything and incorrectly flags what the film's musical identity is going to be. The rest of the music after this point is just another Randy Newman score which sounds like Toy Story. It's not jazz the entire time, and it's not creating enough of an identity for the film to call its own. However, the Bill and Sally theme is gorgeous. I love it. I find the oddly unstable, repetitive exposition in this film quite tiring as well. It has that terrific premise, but it chooses to impart knowledge of it through very obvious means in the opening, and then just reiterates that information again and again in an oddly unconnective way. Firstly, there's that opening simulation where Water News tells recruits about what Monsters Inc. does in plain text, and you get a look at what scaring is. Then there's the commercial for Monsters Inc. saying all of that same information again. And then when Mike and Sully get to the factory, we hear it all for a third time. And while this time I might care about it because it's showing me things and injecting character into it, I also don't care because I feel like I'm being reminded of things I've already heard twice. Basically the setup for the film, like its first 20 minutes, I think is rather on the nose and very clunky, and I don't find it draws me much into the world at large. I'm also just feeling like it's very clearly defining the small pan that it's going to be playing in. I don't even honestly find the characters that compelling until Boo shows up either. With the exception of Water News, I do also think most of the supporting cast are very thin, and this unfortunately includes Randall. He's very well cast and well played by Steve Buscemi, and a very interesting idea for like a chameleon invisible creature. It's spooky, but he's also apparently an inventor who made this machine, and that's super interesting, but he doesn't come across as some kind of smart inventor, he's just a bully who's not all that bright on his own. As an audience member, I understand that Randall is creepy and weird, but I don't really get how he the, the machine thing is credible, or why Mike and Sully have a reason to really pay him any mind initially at least. He's just some dickhead weirdo co-worker. I also think Celia is a really big blind spot for this writing, a very one-note character whose lack of nuance leaves a lot to be desired. She feels a lot more like window dressing than a character with motivations and a purpose within the wider plot, and I really, really doubt you would see a character like this in a Pixar movie today. Unfortunately, I think the editing is a little off in this movie sometimes as well. Chiefly, the snow and the blizzard sections don't really leave that much of an impact within the wider arc of the film, and I think a lot of that's down to how those scenes flow. It comes and goes very quickly. Sally riding down the mountain doesn't feel particularly dangerous or interesting, it's all happening too quickly, and often the film doesn't allow its emotional climaxes to breathe for the right amount of time. Boo attacks and defeats Randall, a really awesome moment, but the scene shifts to Randall being thrown through a door without allowing that tension to dissipate properly, and it feels honestly very just. Jarring. It's cutting the climax before the feeling of it really dies down naturally. The same feeling of cutting away too quickly is there when Mike finds Sully being attacked by the invisible Randall. It's a cool moment while it's playing, but Mike has reappeared from the snow far too quickly and that feels like a continuity error. But the humour here feels like it steps on this tension a bit too quickly and we almost immediately recover. It's editing. The rhythm of the film feels a little off sometimes. The modes of tension are revisited too many times. Mike and Sully are often running away or hiding or sneaking and the film so often goes to those same moods and it doesn't feel cohesive so much as repetitive. While the characters in the story really hit their stride once Boo is on the scene, something that never quite clicks for me in this movie are the environments. Now let me ask you something, does the monster city feel to you? Like it's just one street, this one straight line that Sully and Mike walk down, that's the factory on one end and Harry Harryhausen's on the other. In your mind, does it feel like one street? I don't know if there's much that could be done to help that at the time technically, but I've been watching this film since I was five and it didn't occur to me until this rewatch how I've basically just accepted and internalized the monster city as being just one street. Doesn't really spark the imagination. The interior of the factory, while potentially quite cool with the underground pipe system as well, I honestly feel has a rather weak atmosphere and the story doesn't continually move into new places all that well. Revisiting the same hallways and the same rooms and the scare floor a lot of times in a way that feels repetitive. The interior of Jim Morrison's house was one of the most complicated sets Pixar had built at the time and the scale of it is really impressive. The height is conveyed very well. But on the other hand, feels like it's trying 
trying to replay the airport baggage scene from Toy Story and it doesn't feel as imaginative. Sully and Mike go through some of those doors for joke dioramas where the film's visual constraints feel the most obvious. You didn't have to do this. This really exposes some shortcomings. Sully landing sideways on Mike here. Mmm, that's a little ropey. They go traveling into daytime locations and they still don't encounter adults. It feels like it volunteers to lose believability here and I'm not sure the jokes are worth it. It contributes to what's missing about the world of Monsters Inc. for me on whole. That the whole of it is just too nice. It's too approachable to use the premise to its full potential. Give me a world where monsters have their own cities connected to humans and fuel their own society by being their demons, but do it in a Neil Gaiman graphic novel and don't draw the lion at kids. Have sleep paralysis demons. Have monsters be the manifest forms of mental illnesses and really dark intrusive thoughts. Phobias made into actual physical beings that haunt specific people. You could get so existential and dark with this if you really wanted to. And I'd be much more interested in that kind of version of it than I would be in seeing a blue furry bear try to flush rubber ducks down a toilet. So on one hand, yes, the film is carried by its ideas, but on the other, it's only using a very small percentage of what's possible within that premise. What's possible for Pixar specifically. And I can't help but wonder what might get done if it was in someone else's hands, especially since the darkest parts of Monsters Inc. are the parts where the film shines the brightest anyway. I think the film is actually carried by its main three performances and a handful of moments that are done very, very well. And aside from the aesthetics of the monster world, beneath that in the story the film's actually telling, I think there's honestly some pretty spectacular thematics going on. Billy Crystal and John Goodman are both excellently cast, just perfect. They play these roles so well, easily entering the territory of some of the great movie buddy pairings like Frodo and Sam, Doc and Marty, Charles Dance and being the best actor ever born. But I do think the real secret weapon of Monsters Inc, the killing factor that makes this movie so good is Mary Gibbs. 100% the movie only works because of her. At the time she was the young daughter of a story artist and as the voice of Boo she is just just so good. The non-language vocalizations and the phrases she uses convey the emotions she's trying to get across so very, very well that it's easy to forget that she's not even using proper words. I mean, she names Sally Kitty, but this is the kind of performance you can't get from someone on purpose. It has to be so honest and real. You couldn't get this from an adult. That Mary was recorded by just following her around her house with a microphone gives that character so much reality and life that enables her to do things and say things and be a kind of kid that feels extremely singular for film. A dependent child but one who's expressive enough to pin the entire movie on. If Boo doesn't work, the entire movie doesn't work, but she does, so it does. And something that it does a lot with its main three performances is land a great many very very good jokes. This film is very funny. Using mainly spoons. 2319. You go to Sleep. Got any odorant? I made the reservations under Googly Bear. We're rehearsing a scene from the upcoming company play called Put That Thing Back Where It Came From Also Help Me. Uh, it's a musical. They're rehearsing a play. Sully reacting to the cube of garbage. Sully, that's a cube of garbage. I can still hear her little voice. Yeah, I can too. Wait, how many kids you got in there? Oh, wow, would you look at that? We're out of snow cones. Sorry. Are you kidding me? I love volleyball. I was the fastest one out there. Of course, I was, I was the ball. I was, I was the ball. Quotable, so many memorable lines in this movie. It's very funny. Narratively in my rewatch, I also personally found a lot to relate to in this movie as an uncle. I've got a nephew who's approaching the age that Boo is in the movie. And just last week had a real moment where I was just struck by how special and beautiful and wonderful he is and how much he means to me. But the different kind of attachment I have to him as an uncle and not as a father, I find something to connect with about in the relationship between Sully and Boo. Sully isn't a dad. He doesn't act like a dad to me. He acts like a fun uncle. He doesn't have the tools to raise a child. He doesn't feel like he's raising and imparting himself onto her. He's having fun with her. He doesn't feel like he's in an emotional place where he can give a part of himself to this bit of his soul that has grown legs and is walking around. But he's still just struck by how protective he feels of her. And watching that sense of love and responsibility bloom across the story alongside the goofy fun uncle dynamic is just so terrific 
terrifically paced and extremely compelling to me. To show how deeply he comes to realize that he cares for this child and wasn't expecting to is such an interesting arc and it's sold so well. So for all my problems with the world building, the story this film is actually trying to tell really has some stones to it. There's some really great thematics that in the right light can pack a serious wallop. The moment where Sully is forced to look at himself when he scares Boo is a deeply potent rumination on the nature of rage and intimidation within a professional circumstance. He hasn't felt called to look inward because nobody in his workplace sees that as a problem, but in his personal life it is. How he's fine with scaring theoretical and literal children for a job, dishing out trauma, but feels the weight of that come crashing down on him in a moment is a scene that leads to thematics that I could spend an entire video talking about just to itself. It's incredibly good. And the pathway the film starts walking down, the themes to which it alludes or leads like that, I think is a case in point of something I've already said a bunch of times can hold Pixar back. They're too nice and they need to go darker when they can because this is the benefit. Don't be nice all the time. Monsters Inc's best moments are invariably those times where it drops the pretense of adventure and just gets honest in that unprocessed dirt on the lens way that feels so much more real than many other emotional pulls from Pixar's more recent work. This film does feel more dangerous at times, a bit scarier. It's got tooth in the right areas to help it drive home its message in a way that not only was Monsters U missing, but can often be difficult to find in a lot of their work these days. Who knows why? Because in my experience as a kid, the bits where Monsters Inc. gets a little grim, like when Sully is being choked or roaring or Randall is about to fully murder him and abduct a child he almost sucked the life out of with a life sucking machine, was always what made the movie more interesting. And thematically, it really opens the door to continue thinking about where the film was pointing with some of this stuff for me as an adult. Instead of tying everything up neatly with a bow and giving you a pat on the head and saying, we did all the work for you, that's not nearly as interesting. Leave me with something to grapple with. A few times, things get a bit more gritty in this movie and it's just so, so much more interesting. I really, really like that Monsters Inc. goes there from time to time because it helps every relationship feel better. The development between Mike and Sully feels genuine at high and low points because their tension doesn't feel useless given this backdrop. The turn of water news remains really effective because he's allowed to appear as properly imposing and frightening. Boo and Sully connect because of the many stages of their relationship being contextualized within a larger framework of them facing and conquering their fears, which are shown as having actual effects on the way they go about their lives. This is all made possible by not only paying lip service to the danger, show it, make it feel more real. Boo's fear of Randall makes her more dependent on Sully, but eventually seeing that Sully also has a dark side gives more dimensions to her viewpoint, and she's able to face up to Randall and save Sully without any help. It's almost like she comes to understand that people can be more than they appear. Sully, as a free agent, lives a comfortable life but has everything that he could want, but no real responsibilities. But being confronted with a reason to care about something more than himself, he's asked to decide on what really matters to him, something he seems a little resistant to, but it's not his job or preserving that comfort that really matters to him. For Mike, it is. He wants things to go back to the way they were, easy as pie, and it takes him a bit longer to realize that the world outside of his little bubble, outside of his bedroom, so to speak, the things that he's afraid of aren't really all that bad either. It's a hopeful and elegant story about choosing to face the monster in your closet, whether it's the literal one or the call of responsibility, and the method by which it's all conveyed is lovely. Where it really counts, I'm saying Monsters Inc. sinks most every one of its shots. I can get stuck on the world building the, and the aesthetics of these works sometimes. I find that if a film has a good enough world building to lift me up into its metaphors and themes, I don't really sweat the details. But if it doesn't, I can find them very easy to complain about. But while the visuals of this film don't really do much for me, I do think it is worth connecting with it emotionally. It's worth thinking about what the story means to you. It's worth talking to people about how fear and professionality and responsibility intertwine. It's worth laughing with this. Overall, just because the fiction and approach of Monsters, Inc. falls victim to the worst curse on earth of not appealing to a very specific 20-something year old man in Melbourne, Australia in any lasting way apart from nostalgia doesn't mean it's at all a bad or an interesting film and will very likely remain an awesome time for anyone. I enjoyed this movie too, it's just I'm somewhat unmoved by the actual viewing experience of sitting down to watch this today. I think the story is very strong, the humour is strong, the three main performances carry, the legacy is iconic, the whole project has an undeniably effective emotional core which helps it conquer eventually what I don't like about it and it shows off how beneficial a bit more tooth in your movie can really be when you need it. But I do feel it has an uninteresting world, 
a clunky first act, repetitive modes of tension, editing faults, and some weak supporting characters. The cylinders it's firing on are working overtime to compensate, and they're doing very well. It's a good movie. Boo is such a wonderful character that she alone is worth watching it for, but I would potentially go to say that Monsters Inc. is somewhat overrated today, or it is at least not nearly as unreachable as it's kind of made out to be. Many projects since this by Pixar are as good, if not much better than this. For me, it doesn't have that same spice and charm as it used to across the entire runtime. I'd definitely love to see any projects which might have a similar premise to this, if you know of any, that are aimed at an, in a bit more of a dark direction, because while Inc. has a great premise and it tells a good story within that premise, I feel like it very much scratches the surface of a bigger idea that I personally would love to see elaborated on elsewhere. But what I can wholeheartedly say, in testament to the reasons where I think this film is strongest, that Monsters, Inc. probably has the strongest ending of any Pixar work. That ending scene is epiphanic. Sully poking his head through the door and smiling when Boo says Kitty off screen is probably one of the most emotive final shots of any animated film I've ever seen. A captivatingly beautiful payoff to a wonderful relationship between Sully and Boo which was developed, progressed and displayed and animated lovingly and with great care throughout the film is just crystallized in that moment. And to see monsters work up so effectively to such a stunning and utterly happy conclusion is joyous. What a spectacular finish. Kitty. Monsters Inc, just like Cars 3 and Incredibles 2, is a good movie that's worth watching, but to me, represents the threshold of Pixar itself, teetering on the edge of doing what they're best at. It best demonstrates that idea to me. Using their initial concept, the premise of the movie, as a smokescreen for a deeper, more meaningful tale that they sneak up on you with, without advertising. This is the balance point. Hey, thanks for watching another episode of Pixar Quality. I really hope you enjoyed it. This one was a couple of tough nuts to crack in this one, but uh, you know, I'm here to I'm here to crack tough nuts. <laughs> uh, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more. I'm gonna make more regardless, but you know, it's the thing I have to say. My name's Micah. Thank you very much for being here, and I hope you have a great day. Bye.